and welcome to this brief presentation about the draft adult social care charging policy. Cornwall Council is currently consulting on proposed changes to the way it charges adults for social care. Over the next few slides, I will explain how we developed the draft policy, what is different, the main changes in the policy, how we are consulting and the timetable for us making a decision. Firstly, I'd like to explain some background to how we have developed the policy. Adult Social Care has previously consulted on changes to its adult social care charging policy, and we last proposed some changes in December of 2017. However, some concern was expressed about the amount of time we made available for that consultation, and so we decided not to complete it. We took advice after that on our approach to consultation and has since been listening to views from voluntary and community sector organisations and also people who have support from adult social care. We consulted last year on changes to our direct payment policy. And during that time, a number of people took the opportunity to talk to us about adult social care charging as well. We learnt a lot during that period of time and subsequently we have now drafted a new policy to reflect that learning and we've written it in a language which we hope is easier to understand included links to other information so that the document can be used as a guide and we've also added sections on issues that we previously didn't explain fully we took that draft document back to some of the voluntary and community sector organisations, not to ask if they agreed with the policy proposals, but to ask them if we had written it in a language that was easier to understand. We made some further changes, having taken some comments and feedback from them, and we subsequently presented that draft to our Health and Adults Overview and Scrutiny Committee who approved it for consultation in February of this year. As you will know, we have subsequently had a pandemic with COVID, and that means that our planned approach to consultation could not proceed. I will talk separately on a future slide about the approach that we have taken. So what is new within the document? The firstly, as I've said uh, already, we've tried to write it in a simpler language. However, it is not only the use of plain English that changes the language within the document. We've also changed some of the terminology. People may be used to hearing the terms financial assessment and client contribution. People have told us that that is misleading and it suggests that adult social care is paid for by the council and that people may be asked to make a contribution. That is not correct. The actual position is that all adults in Cornwall are charged for any adult social care they require. However, they can make an application for financial assistance. So the language that we are using now is charge and application for financial assistance. We also have included additional information. And we have included links so people can find that information easily. I will give a couple of examples. The first example is in relation to the minimum income guarantee. When we calculate how much charge of a charge a person will pay for their adult social care, we have to ensure that the person retains a minimum amount of money for them to live on. That is what is known as the minimum income guarantee. That money 
is calculated by central government. Our current policy is now several years out of date and having a figure in there is meaningless because it will not represent the amount of money that we would allow today. We have therefore put a link in so people can very easily click on that and find out exactly how much money they are guaranteed to be left with each week for their living costs. Another example relates to shared lives. Shared lives is a scheme where a person will live with another family and they will provide the person's care and support, but also their board and lodgings. The board and lodgings, so their rent and their living costs, are a private matter between the individual and that family. And adult social care cannot help with those costs. However, the person may be entitled to housing benefit. So instead of simply saying that within our document, we have give, given a link directly to the application for housing benefit. This means that instead of a person having to telephone the council again, ask to get put through to another department, they can find that information immediately so that it makes life easier for them. We have also included some new sections. Within those sections, and I don't intend to go through all of these in detail today. However, I need to emphasize that our policy position on these items has not changed. However, we simply are explaining them so that again, a little bit like my example with self shared lives, people understand the information so that they have a complete understanding of their position. I will give one small example, NHS continuing healthcare. We didn't previously explain this in our policy document. However, if somebody becomes entitled to NHS continuing healthcare, they are no longer charged for their adult social care. If a person previously was entitled to NHS continuing healthcare and ceases to be entitled to that, they will then be charged for their adult social care and will need to make an application for financial assistance. It's quite a simple point, but important that we actually explain that carefully within the document. The other thing that we have done is to confirm our plan and we set this out within the direct payments policy to introduce a self-service option for people to be able to make an application for financial assistance. Currently, if somebody wants to know how much of a charge they will pay for adult social care, they need to contact the council. A charging officer will take them through a series of questions, ask for some documents, then make a calculation and tell the person how much they will pay. That can take some time. Instead, in the future, people will be able to go on to a link and go through that same set of questions, but at their own pace. They could do that over a period of a couple of days. So rather than feeling pressurized and answering questions to a charging officer, they can go through that within the comfort of their home and find out how much they will need to pay for adult social care. This means that we will be ensuring that people have the option of finding out very early on in the process so they can make informed decisions about how they arrange their care. So now I want to explain the main changes to our current policy. There are four of them. The first change relates to the date from which we will charge a person for care that is provided to them in their own homes. Our current policy says that we will start to charge from the date when we have told the person what that charge will be. That can sometimes be delayed and I will go through a case study in a short while to explain that. In future we are proposing that we will start to charge for care that is provided to a person in their own home from the date that that service starts. 
This brings it into line with the approach that we have for people that receive care in a care home, which starts from the date the person is admitted. The second change is how we calculate a charge for respite care. This is for when a person has a short break away from their home, which provides their carers with a period of respite. We currently apply the rules that we would use to calculate care at home. So that assumes that people have all their normal expenses um, for daily living and so on, and those do not change. However, in reality, they are staying away from home and some of those costs will normally be lower. So we are proposing to change the set of rules that we apply and we are intending to use the rules for that we use to calculate the cost of a short stay in a care home. The third change that we are proposing to introduce only affects those people who already pay all of their adult social care costs. So these are people who are not entitled to financial assistance. At the moment, we can arrange a package of care and support and do so for a number of people. And we do that without any charge. We are proposing, along with the majority of other councils in the country, to introduce a charge to cover the cost that the council incurs in providing that service. The final change affects very few people. When we proposed this change initially, which is to remove the subsidy for meals that the council provides, the council was directly employing catering staff in its day centres to provide people with a meal at a subsidised price. A few people who are at home do receive a meal. We are proposing to remove that subsidy so people will pay the actual cost of the meal. I need to emphasise at this point that this does not cover the charges for people who are helped to prepare a meal in their home. It is only those people who actually receive a meal that is supplied to them. I said that I would go through a couple of case studies. The first one explains the change for calculating respite care costs. These are real cases, but we've changed the name and the circumstances so that it remains anonymous. So in our first case, we have Brenda, who is a pensioner and has an income of £428 per week. As part of Brenda's care and support, she has a two week period of respite in a care home. And the full cost of that respite break is £900 per week. In this particular case study, it's important to note that Brenda is going to start her stay on a Monday. The reason that's important is because adult social care currently have a standard charging week which begins on a Saturday. And if a respite stay doesn't begin on a Saturday, then more than two weeks of support would get charged for because it overlaps the charging week. So under the current policy, we are going to calculate Brenda's charge in the same way that we would calculate the charge for care at home. And as I've explained previously, that means that although Brenda will have a reduced household daily living and possibly disability related expenditure during her stay away from home, we would still allow all of those expenses when calculating the charge that Brenda has to pay. The charge that we have calculated applying those rules in this particular example is £233 per week. However, as I've explained already, because the charges start from a Saturday, her stay spans three charging weeks and therefore we will charge three times that weekly amount, meaning Brenda is going to pay a charge of just under £700 for her respite break. So under the new policy, there are two things that are going to change for Brenda. 
The first is that we are now going to calculate the charge in the way that we would calculate a temporary care home stay. That means that we will allow less of Brenda's household, daily living and disability related expenditure, which will mean that Brenda will pay a higher charge. When we calculate the cost for Brenda, applying those rules, Brenda's charge increases to just under £400 per week. However, the other policy change is that we are now only going to charge Brenda for the actual amount of days that she has. Uh, she is uh, in her respite break, and that means that Brenda's total charge is going to be just under £800 or an equivalent of £50 per week higher charge than she previously paid. The second case study explains the change to the date from which we will start to charge for home care. In this particular case, we have Betty, who has just had a stay in hospital and is being discharged to her home with a package of home care support. That package is going to start on Monday the 15th of June and the full cost of that package, which Betty would pay if she was a self-funder, is £150 per week. Betty has made an application for financial assistance and we are going to assess her on the Thursday after she's been discharged from hospital. However, on that day, Betty has told us she's not feeling very well and asks if the appointment can be deferred to the Monday. We do that and when we complete Betty's assessment, we calculate that she needs to pay a charge of £120 per week towards the cost of her care. Under the current policy, we will not charge Betty until the Saturday after we have calculated that charge. That means that Betty has a period of 12 days of free care, which is equivalent to just over £200, which is income that council does not receive and we will not have available to meet other needs of people in Cornwall. Under the new policy, we are proposing to change that date that Betty starts to pay the charge to the date that care starts. As I explained at the beginning of this presentation, that means that we are bringing it into line with the way we charge for care in a care home. So Betty will pay her £120 per week charge from the date she starts to receive that care, the 15th of June. That means the council will have an increased level of income to be able to support other people with eligible needs in Cornwall. Those were the main changes to the policy. And I now want to explain our approach to consultation. We had initially intended to run a number of public events. We were going to run six uh, public workshops and have three drop in sessions for people to be able to contact us. During COVID, that has not been possible. And so we have taken a slightly different approach. To make people aware of the opportunities for getting involved, we have wrote directly to four and a half thousand people. Those people are those who have care needs, who previously had care needs in the previous 12 month period, and for families of young people who are soon going to become adults and need to pay adult social care charges. We also wrote separately to all those people who have respite care, because as I've explained already, one of the main changes affects them. We contacted the Voluntary Sector Forum, who have distributed information through their newsletters and directly to all 219 of their member organisations. We have involved the partnership boards, which are run by Healthwatch. We've made a presentation to the Carers Partnership Board and information has been supplied to the others. 
we have contacted and provided a presentation to all of the care providers in Cornwall through Cornwall Partners in Care. We've directly mailed to voluntary and community sector organisations and asked their support in distributing information to those people they support in Cornwall. We have also tried to raise public awareness through social media, the mainstream media and through our website. We are currently in the process of running 28 public webinars. So these are presentations like this. And we started those on the 7th of July and they are being run up till the 28th of October. We have provided a variety of times for those meetings to try and make them as accessible as possible, including different times of the day and evening sessions. We have also undertaken webinars for our staff to make them aware and those happen throughout July and August of this year and we've also then run additional webinars for the partnership boards the voluntary sector forum and a number of other organizations that have asked us to do them we have also uh, engaged with our health partners who have also distributed information throughout GPs, for example, and we've run webinar sessions for um, them as well. If it's safe to do so, we will still run face to face workshops. However, it is highly unlikely we will be able to do that. And so we have ensured that we've given as much opportunity as possible for people to engage with us. And that has included people contacting us by telephone. Where people have contacted by telephone, a person who has a good level of knowledge of the draft policy calls them back to discuss their concerns and to listen to their comments. We've also provided the opportunity on our website where we have additional information. We have an easy read document which explains the main changes and how people can get involved. We have case study examples to explain how the changes may impact on people. People can write to us. We have included an online survey and people can also download any of these documents and print them if they prefer to do it that way. If people haven't got the ability to print, they can contact us and we will send them hard copies of any documents. At the moment, we have had quite a positive response to the consultation. As of today, we have had over 280 online survey forms completed. To give you a comparison, we received 142 surveys for the direct payments policy that we consulted on last year. So what will happen next? The consultation will close on the 11th of November. We originally had proposed to conclude the consultation on the 11th of September, but having listened to some comments from members of the public and from the Carers Partnership Board, we decided to extend that by a further two months. The original time period had allowed three months for consultation, but people told us that COVID had been a difficult time for them and they didn't feel that three months was adequate time for them to be able to make an informed response to the consultation. We understand that and we decided to give a further two months to give people more time to be able to express their views. We would prepare a report after the 11th of November and that will be taken initially to our council management teams in December. Following that, we will take a further report and propose changes to the policy to the Health and Adults Overview and Scrutiny Committee in January of next year. Scrutiny will then make a recommendation to the full cabinet, which meets on the 17th of March of 2021. Cabinet will make a decision and we will then publish any changes that are agreed, provide feedback on this consultation 
and introduce changes that are agreed from the 1st of April of 2021. I hope that has been helpful. We have information available on our website and if people have questions, they can telephone us or join us for a public webinar at some point in the future. Thank you.